Good morning, fledgling chiropractors! So you guys can't make more noise than I can with the mic. Let's try it again. Good morning, fledgling chiropractors! Oh, that was a little better. The reason why I want to hear that enthusiasm is because we have a gentleman with us this morning who could really, the best I can do is describe him as truly one of the grand old men. And I don't even want to say old too much because he's not that much older than me. One of the grand old men of chiropractic. You have no idea what a privilege it's going to be for you to listen to this man this morning, but I will tell you that you will remember having listened to him when you're 70 years old. <clears throat> Dr. Arlen Four is a graduate from Logan College, 1961. He was sent to Logan College by his chiropractor, Dr. Lee. When he came out of Logan College, he went back and worked with Dr. Lee, and the two of them working together developed a nice little instrument called the activator, which is in fact one of the five biggest techniques in chiropractic. He has contributed to the formation of three different chiropractic colleges, contributing significantly to Logan's reinvigoration, to Life University's formation, to the Parker College's formation. He's been a very active clinical researcher. He has published more than 25 peer-reviewed papers. And in case you think he's just a researcher, let me tell you that this gentleman has seen 1,000 patients a week for 25 years. So if you want some chiropractic creds, please pay attention for the next few minutes as we listen to the words of Dr. Arlen Four. <clears throat> Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to introduce uh, somebody, a couple of people here that help us in the activator world. Uh, Dr. Laura Huber, who is the head of the activator teaching classes here. And Bridget Kennard couldn't be here this morning. She had a conflict, but she's the other person that teaches activator. And we're always grateful to have all these different uh, people teaching. And, also, Tim Guest, who is in the clinic in administration, and he's a teacher. And you all know my friend, Jill Lamosh. Do you ever hear of him? <laughs> We've been friends for a long time. And I called him up one day and I said, you know, uh, Jill, I've got a, a program I think that would be interesting for life students. It's called Can a Scientist and a Vitalist Coexist? And he said, well, that sounds very interesting. And so I said, uh, I'm on my way down to Florida, Palmer, Florida. I'll stop by. And uh, this is a brand new program. So we'll, we'll just stop and have a look and see if they can coexist. And what do you think the answer is? Absolutely. Well, absolutely they can. And uh, see, I'm a pro-vitalist. And I also value scientific research. And I just developed this program, and there should be another slide right here. And the slide should say, I'm an evidence-based vitalist. How do you like that? Is that okay to be evidence-based? Yes. See, the kids coming in today, I'm talking to a microbiologist sitting here in the front row, and he said, you know, I really don't believe something unless I see some evidence. Well, I think by the time I get done here this morning, you're not only going to be happy to be a chiropractor, you're going to see that we've got plenty of evidence. And if any of you are innate, intelligent type people, I'm going to show you on a slide what innate intelligence is all about. Then, anybody ever hear of a subluxation here? <laughs> well, how many of you uh, have ever seen one? Have you seen one? Really? Seen a subluxation? Tell me about it if you've seen it. Where have you seen it? You heard about it. But how about seeing it? Something you can take your iPhone out and take a picture of. No? Okay, good, because I'm going to show you a slide of a subluxation this morning. And it came out of a school that you might have heard of called Yale, small eastern school, but we'll, we'll get into that. And I just wanted to tell you, uh, 
Why chiropractic vitalists need chiropractic scientists? It's called collaboration. Did you ever hear that word collaboration? In chiropractic, we hardly ever use the word collaboration. We all fight. Why is that, you know? Well, you wouldn't be a chiropractor if you weren't independent. You're independent spirits, and that's, that's just fine. But I remember, I mean, in Arizona, we pick chiropractors when they're in the first grade. Teacher looks out, sees the kids fighting in the sandbox, this kid doesn't relate well to people, and she makes a note on her card that says, possible chiropractor. <laughs> Just could be a chiropractor. Now, vitalism is the understanding and principle that all organic systems in the universe are conscious, self-developing, self-maintaining, and self-healing. That good enough definition for you? Well, what about science? The knowledge or a system of knowledge covering general truths or the operation of general laws, especially as obtained and tested through the scientific method. That's science. Now let me tell you my story. I started out in Redwood Falls, Minnesota, farming town of 4,000 people. And I started out with my partner who sent me to school. And uh, how many of you have any student debt when you get out? Anybody? You think you can start a practice with debt? I can tell you how. I started with a 56 Ford convertible, which I had to sell in Minnesota because the snow came in, a pregnant wife and a diploma. Those were my two assets in 1964. And my partner, or the person that sent me to school, I went to him and said, I don't have any money, and I don't have any place to practice. And here's what he said. Why don't you take one of my adjusting rooms? Why don't you just use that until you find out where you want to go? Well, that little test lasted 18 years. But what I'm trying to tell you, it didn't cost me anything because he didn't charge me any rent until I started having patients. And then I think one day he said, you know, maybe I should have a little rent, and I gave him a little rent. So I tested this on students today. A young lady from Dallas, Texas came up to me and said, I don't want to work for a man. I don't know if you know this, but 50% of the people in chiropractic college today are women. And I said, you don't want to work for a man. I agree with you. You're probably smarter anyway. So what I'd like to have you do is go find out where you want to practice, what town, go in and find a chiropractor with a big clinic and ask him if you can lease a room. Because she had a portable table and an activator. That was her total office equipment. <clears throat> Long story short, she went into this guy's office. He said, yes, I'd like to have you because I need overhead relief. So she rented a room and she started within 30 days she was cash flowing. Within a year, she went to him again and said, I'd like to rent two rooms. And at the end of three years, he said, would you like to buy the clinic? And she said, no, I don't want the overhead. <laughs> now she bought a house instead of the clinic. You see where I'm going here? Everybody gets the idea that they have to really get out there and have this big, large clinic. And we had them, didn't we, Dr. Lamash? We had these big clinics. And uh, were they fun? Sure, but you don't need them right away. Get started, start paying things off. And to make a long story short, today, she's still in those two rooms. This is five years ago today, and she's making a lot of money. And somebody asked me here this morning, what's the future of chiropractic? And the answer is really good. Here's why. Obamacare has done nothing but have a what? Emergency service, it's just a high deductible. The average person on Obamacare has $6,000 deductible. $6,000 and they gotta go pay for anything that goes on in between. And if they have insurance, chiropractic office calls are cheaper than the copay. So the people are coming in getting a discount on office calls. Now this little 4,000 town up here was where we developed Activator. And you know, God didn't open the heavens and a voice came out and said, I'm gonna show you Activator. It didn't work like that. I made thumb thrusts like this for three years until my elbows got so sore at night, I would put them in ice water like a pitcher does to take the swelling out of my elbows. And I'd get up in the morning, put them in hot water to get them going. 
and the only person faithful to me to sit by me while I was soaking was my dog. <laughs> and he'd sit there and look up like, you're really stupid. <laughs> so we started to develop because we had to simply to save our, our elbows. And by the way, I've started several different things and I've been a practitioner. And by the way, I've never practiced alone in my life. I always had a partner all the way through my chiropractic career. Why? I wanted to get adjusted. <laughs> so be, either have a partner or be close to somebody that you can partner with to get care. Uh, I've been in multidisciplinary centers. This is a neighborhood Christian clinic and it was such a bad area in Phoenix that they had to chain the uh, air conditioners to the building. And I remember the first day I went in, <clears throat> there was a car in a parking lot and the tires were stripped off. And I went in and said to the clinic director, can I leave my car outside? Is it safe or are my tires gonna be gone? Oh, he said, you'll be fine. I said, how do you know? He said, cause you're gonna go out and on the left rear tire, you're gonna see a gang sign. And I said, what does that mean? He said, that means you're a doctor or a priest and you get a buy in the barrio. <laughs> you're totally safe. Now, sometimes your goals don't come true right away. Here's one that took me 50 years. I am a fully credentialed VA physician. This is the Carl T. Hayden Center for Ambulatory Care. This is my first staff when I started at the VA. And I started the chiropractic service at the VA in Phoenix. And we built it to where we had 200 patients a week coming through and a three month waiting list. We have 78,000 patients at the Veterans Administration in Phoenix alone. Chiropractic became the most favored service in all of the whole system. I'm standing in the Starbucks line. We have a Starbucks, yes. I'm standing in the Starbucks line one morning and the head rheumatologist comes up and he put his hand on my shoulder. He said, hi, Arlen. I said, hi. He said, I just wanted to tell you guys I'm really happy you're here. I said, well, tell me why. He said, well, you know, he said, we get dinged if we give too many class four narcotics. We get it against our record. So he said, what we do with chronic pain is we just send them down to you. I said, oh, so we're the dumping service? Well, he said, yes, but you know what's really funny? They're getting well. So he said, I hope you never leave because they're actually getting well. Isn't that interesting? So this is how I started though, using my thumbs. And uh, think of this now, 100 thrusts, 100 thrusts, 100 thrusts. And we started then, and in 1976, we built the very first activator. You can see it on the left. It was an interesting story. We had a bunch of them that failed. And I had a dentist that came to me one day for sciatica and I was telling him how I wanted something with a fast thrust. He said, I think we've got the thing for you. He said, we have a thing in dentistry called a surgical mallet. It's got a scalpel on the end and it splits wisdom teeth. He said, now I suggest you take the scalpel out. <laughs> It'd be a good idea if you put a door stop on that and the brake shoe ribbon. That was our total R&D. And it worked. And that's how we started. And then we found out that it wouldn't hold up under chiropractic care. Because remember, they only did two or three thrusts a year. We were doing a thousand a day. And so what they did then is this chiropractic student out in Los Angeles had a friend who was a engineer. And he said, I can build one that will hold together. And that's how the first activator was built an engineer from Switzerland. And he built that one, and that was the internal guts of the activator as we went up the line. Now look at number two up here, and I don't know if you can see this pointer, but you can see it's got a little cone on it. Well, we started into research. In 1994, we discovered the actual vibration of the body is 50 to 70 hertz. When you're sitting there, you're vibrating, you don't even know it, but you're vibrating along 50 to 70 hertz. Well. When we found it vibrated at 50 to 70 hertz by putting that 44 gram weight on the end of the instrument, we could coactivate mechanoreceptors at twice the rate. And all of a sudden we discovered something. We discovered how we could stimulate the body. Then in 2000, we built an instrument that didn't have the right settings. 
sent it out to our clinicians and they said, well, it's okay, but. So by 2004, we had reconfigured the whole instrument. So see, it should be called search instead of research because you know, it's, we don't know, we're searching to find out what's, what's happening, what's going on. And by the way, we have two textbooks. And I, let me tell you how I got stimulated to do a textbook, because anybody ever written a book? Well, don't. <laughs> it takes two years and you have post book partum and it's terrible, it's, it's an awful thing to do, so please don't. But Dana Lawrence, the, the, he was the executive chairman of the GMPT said, you gotta have a book, Arlen, or nobody's gonna remember what you did. Now I'm sitting in church one morning, the pastor gets up and he said, what are the three big religions in the world? Number one is Judaism. Number two is what? Christianity. Three is Islam. And he said, then why are they so popular? Well, Judaism has the Torah. Uh, Christianity has the Bible. And Islam has the Quran. And I went, oh my God, I better write this down. <laughs> That's what stimulated me to write a textbook. Then we were stupid enough and we did number two. But now I knew about post book partum. And my associate editor called up one day, because remember, we're talking every day. And by the way, my associate editor lives in, in Colorado. I live in Phoenix. We did it all on go to meeting. She called me up one day and said, you don't love me anymore? I said, what do you mean? You haven't called me every day. I said, no, the book is over. The baby's born. You don't have to call every day. But we worked so hard on this to put it out. And uh, by the way, it's now published in Japanese. Next is Spanish. And so when chiropractic gets out in the world, you have to have it in publications. This is an Activator 5. This is the latest. And uh, I was telling Dr. Koch this morning, got out of my wife's car about three years ago, and I just turned like this, and my right knee went out. I mean, it was where I had to use a set of crutches to go. And my wife said, you're going in to get an MRI. And husbands listen to their wives. So I went and got an MRI and the guy says, you have a seven millimeter tear on the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. And we'll scope you on Monday. Scope me? Yeah, you got a seven millimeter tear. I said, what if you put the scope in? Then what am I gonna have? Well, then you're gonna have a 14 millimeter tear. And I said, well, then why would I scope it? He said, what are you gonna do about it? I said, I'm going to my chiropractor. We found out by putting a force, and we'll get into this later, but we've got a force that works on ligaments. And by the way, ligaments can be subluxated. And so, well, two weeks later, I got a call from his physician's assistant and said, we're ready to give you your complete knee transplant. And I said, why would I have a knee transplant? I'm fine. She said, well, what do you mean you're fine? I said, I went to my chiropractor. She said, well, maybe you want a partial knee transplant. <laughs> I mean, can you believe? Can you believe this? You can't even begin to believe what the medical people will sell people. Uh, we're one of the most widely researched techniques. In 1986, we published our first paper in JMPT. And I go from here to Palmer, Florida to speak, then to Toronto on Saturday night to go to a retirement party of a person that I came to love. His name is John Triano. He's the first one that wrote a scathing letter to the editor about how rotten my paper was. And I called him up and I said, Jay, do you hate me? He said, no, I don't hate you, but you're just an entrepreneur trying to get into the academic world. And I said, well, stand by, because I'm staying. That turned into a long-term friendship and many papers together. In 2016, now we've had over 150 peer-reviewed papers. And I was talking to some students over here and they said, what do you think of X technique? And everybody comes up to me and say, well, what do you think of Cox? Well, the answer is Cox is great on certain things because there's plenty of evidence. And then they go, what do you think of this instrument or that instrument or this instrument? And my answer is, I don't see any clinical trials. I cannot make a judgment. How can I make a judgment if it hasn't been peer reviewed and it's in the literature? And it's less it's in the literature, it's called hall talk. Everybody talks about how great their technique is in the hall. Put them on a platform, it's not as great. Clinical trials, that's tough. 
It only took us 28 years to do 21 clinical trials. And I'm talking to a microbiologist up here and he said, man, you did really well. It's hard to do clinical trials. The activator is the only instrument adjusting technique with clinical trials to support its efficacy. Now, we have 21 clinical trials. Uh, anybody ever hear of Baylor College of Medicine? That's where our head researcher resides. Dr. Michael Liebschner, he's a Vermont PhD with a Berkeley postdoc. He's from Germany. And uh, one of the most brilliant people that I've ever worked with. And uh, we started looking at the subluxation theory. And I asked somebody up here, have you ever seen a subluxation? Well, I hope you've got your iPhones or your phones with you today because I'm going to show you one. I mean, I bet you've talked about it here, right? Well, I want you to see one. I want you to actually be able to get up and take a picture. And I'll just stop. You can walk up, take a picture of that subluxation, and then you all can run around at night and say, I've seen a subluxation. Who started it? DD. And the more I see DD, by the way, the more he's right. The more I see what he was doing. So have you ever seen one? Let's take a look. It's like looking for a polar bear in a snowstorm. You have to be from Minnesota to understand that slide, or Canada. But what's the subluxation complex? Well, here's the Association of Chiropractic Colleges. The subluxation is a complex of functional and or structural and or pathological articular changes that compromise neural integrity, may influence organ system, function in general health. Now that is about a big saying of nothing. Isn't that pretty broad? Yeah, it's intended to be broad. That's right, David, it's intended to be broad. So we said, let's see if we can do this scientifically. We went to Arizona State University. And there was a professor there by the name of George Stallmach who was famous. And he was famous in small motor movement because he got about $10 million from NIH to look at Parkinson's disease. And I said to him, Dr. Stallmach, can we measure leg length inequality? He said, how far does it move? And I said, oh, a millimeter, more than a millimeter. He said, if we can measure fine motor movement, we can measure leg length and equality. No problem. I said, we don't have to have a clinician involved. He said, no, we'll use optical electric. Here's what it looked like. These are optical electric cameras up here. They point down here on the feet. There is no clinician. So then we took students that didn't have subluxations according to our analysis, and then we took students that did. And the first time we've been able to separate somebody that has subluxations and somebody doesn't. Now this is what we call a C5 isolation test. The student lifted their head, that co-activates the mechanoreceptors in C5, and we have a reaction resulting in measurable leg length reactivity. This is what happens with somebody that does not have a subluxation. See how the red line and the blue line are close together? There's no change. Now look at somebody that has a subluxation. Does it look a little different? It was the first time we could quantify that we could actually isolate a subluxation in the body. The very first time. Now we've got several other ones than that. And look around at techniques and ask, do they know where? Do they know when? And do they know when to stop? Probably one of the most difficult things is for a clinician to leave a patient alone. Let the body do the healing. Okay? Now, <clears throat> you ever hear of Manohar Panjabi? Panjabi is a famous person. I have to tell you a story. I uh, got a call one day from Jack Winters at ASU. He's the head of the Department of Biomechanics. And he said, how would you like to go to a real conference? I said, I'd love it. Well, he said, we're having the first world bio conference at UC, that's University of California, San Diego. 3,000 biomechanists and scientists show up at this conference. And I'm standing with Jack, and down in the middle, there was a crowd of people around this little East Indian guy who was about five foot five. And I said to Dr. Winters, who's that? He said, oh, that's Manamor Panjabi. I said, who is he? He said, he's famous. He's a biomechanist from Yale. I said, well, I want to meet him. He said, you'll never get close to him. I said, watch me. So I waited until I had my opening. I walked up and I said, Dr. Panjabi, I'm Dr. Four. I'm a chiropractor. Would you like to go to dinner tonight? 
You know what he said to me? Who's buying? I said, I'm buying. He said, well, that beats the heck out of taking 15 graduate students following me around to go eat with. Yeah, I'll go with you. Now, Jack Winter fainted. <coughs> Here I am, <coughs> my first conference, having dinner with Panjabi. And on the back of a napkin, he wrote down what I should be doing for the next five years in my research project. Was that worth dinner? Yeah, I think it was. So then I became friends with him, and we started corresponding. Well, he was doing stuff at Yale that supported what we're doing. Now, watch this. Uh, you'll hear these stories, you know, I just bent over to pick up the dog dish and I couldn't move. We now know why. Here's what happens. Intact, this is normal. Intact mechanoreceptors have normal transducer signals, normal feedback. They have a neuromuscular control unit, normal muscle response pattern, normal response. They get a coordination of individual muscle activation, which gives normal feedback, and there's no adverse consequences. That's the person that reaches over, picks up the dog dish, whoops, and nothing happens. That's normal. Now, let's take a look. Here's what Ben Jabi found. This is not chiropractic. I mean, he wasn't a chiropractor, but look what he found. This is what we call isolation testing and activator. When the spine performs a routine task or responds to an external challenge, the disrupted, injured mechanoreceptors produce corrupted transducer signals describing vertebral position spinal loads for each spinal level. Is that important? Yeah. That's what tells us what area we're going to adjust. And he looked at that from a neurophysiology -phys side, or biomechanics side. Now, get your iPhones ready, because here it goes. Here's an injured mechanoreceptor, corrupted transducers, feedback is bad, the neuromuscular control unit puts bad signals down to the corrupted muscle response, and the coordination of individual muscle activation throws feedback that's corrupted, and you have adverse consequences. This is what a subluxation is over here. Now watch what it produces. Higher stress and strains and injured in ligaments. Remember ligaments, mechanoreceptors, and muscles. And here's what that causes. Muscle fatigue, higher facet loads, and by the way, we always thought, I, I thought, that the activator people were facet doctors because we went into the facets, fired on the facets, fired, fired on the transverse affecting the facets, and we were. But that was just part of it. That caused true inflammation. And what did inflammation cause? Chronic back pain. Now take your time and take the picture because that's a subluxation. That's what a subluxation looks like. And that's what it produces. It looks like that, and that's what it produces. Does that make sense to you? Makes sense to you as a microbiologist? It makes sense? I mean, it's got all the things that happen in the nervous system. Everybody got their picture? Everybody good? I want to just stop. If you don't, that's fine. Just take it. And then mark up above subluxation. Are we all good? Now, so a subluxation is validated by academics. And by the way, I'm not an academic, I'm just a curious clinician. I just wanted to find out, how does this work? I saw so many daily miracles, I wanted to know, what am I doing? Now, it, also it takes courage to test your baby. Because, you know, activator's my baby. And what if it doesn't test right? Well, that's the way it works. And so you have to put it to the test, and have we found things that didn't work? Yep. Did we change them? Yep. So let's continue. We're looking for a gold standard. Now, this is Richard Roy. He's a PhD from the University of Quebec in Montreal. 
he found the effects of a manually assisted mechanical force on cutaneous temperature. It changed cutaneous temperature. And here's what he found out. 66 healthy people, 36 women, 30 men, with acute low back conditions were recruited. The bilateral cutaneous temperature was recorded at L4 and L5 using digitized infrared segmental thermometry. That's different than thermo thermography. Advanced proficiency rated doctors evaluated all subjects according to activator protocol to determine in the presence of an L4, L5 subluxation using isolation testing. And they could do that. Now, how many thrusts should you use per contact? See, today there's a whole bunch of people out there using things like arthrostim and the impulse, all these bang, 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 bang. That's called percussion. That's been around since Egypt. Now, I want to show you why not to use percussion. This little chart right here, if you didn't believe in innate intelligence, you will when I get done with you. Here's the first thrust given right there. The body goes into a cooling and then a warming effect. Now watch this. Five minutes later, without touching the body, it goes into another cooling and then a higher warming effect. That's innate intelligence healing the body. That's the first time you've probably seen an innate intelligence example. Does that make sense to you? And that's when you want to leave the body alone. Let the body do the healing. Remember when I told you less is more? Sometimes, I learned this by accident. In this town that I practiced in, I'm a farm kid. And I knew farmers quit when the sun goes down. So I thought, gee, what a good time to have a practice. So from 7 to 10 o'clock at night, I'd usually see about 100 people. Because when the sun went down, the pickups came in. And you know what I learned? The faster I adjusted them, the better they got, and the more new people they sent. And I just went through and looked at my records. I wasn't spending a huge amount of time, three minutes maybe with a patient, but I was clearing everything, cleared what I needed to, got out of there, let the body do the work. Those were the people that were showing the best results. I kind of learned it by accident. But just, let's do this one more time. First thrust came in right here, and then the cooling effect took place. Then a warming effect. Five minutes later, you went into an automatic second cooling and a higher warming. Isn't that interesting? That the body was doing the work by, once it was thrust, the DNA took over. How many thrusts did you use per contact point? Just one. I mean, if there's any upper cervical people in here, how many do they do? They don't bang on an atlas. They make one thrust. My old friend Roy Sweat says, Arlen, keep researching. Work yourself to death because you're proving what I know. I knew it all along. But don't you like to have the evidence to see it? Conclusion, when contacting the skin with the instrument with a thrust respecting the standard loading principle, the treatment group, it produced a secondary cooling. That's at time limit five, followed by a rewarming at time limit or time marker 10. Five minutes later, the body was really starting to work. So less is more. That's what I want you to take from that. This less is more. Zhu Zheng Song. He's a Chinese medical doctor, PhD. Um, we did a paper on inflammation. And he invited me to Wenchow, China, because in, in China, to, produce, or to give your own paper is considered egotistical. So he let me give it. So I get up and I give this paper. And at the end of the thing, they had some questions and so forth. And uh, somebody got up in the middle of the audience and said something in Chinese. And I said to my interpreter, what did he say? He said, he wanted to know, he's got nine people that can't walk in the hospital. He wants to know if you'll take care of them. I said, absolutely. What I didn't know is they loaded up ambulances, and before the conference was over, they drove them in the back of the conference, <laughs> called them down the center aisle on gurneys, and here I am down there with a portable table adjusting nine people that can't walk. Well, eight of them got up and walked out. <laughs> but you think you ought to know where to adjust? when to adjust and, and when to leave them alone? I mean, these are seriously, seriously bunged up people. Well, Zhu Zheng Song had the idea that we could 
lower inflammation with chiropractic. So he said, let's do a lab experiment and we'll see if we can reduce pain, hyperalgesia, and so forth. These are our patients, 60 of them. We ended up with 57, three got away. <laughs> but here's the main results. <laughs> Activator significantly reduced intravertebral foramina inflammation induced. In other words, they went in there with a needle and introduced inflammation into the IVF. And then we started adjusting rats to see if we could lower the inflammation. Thermal hypoalgesia left, mechanical allodyne went down, hyperexcitability of sensor neurons went down. And, uh, whoops, let me back up, sorry. Here's a slide you want to pay attention to. This is the controlled DRG. That's a dorsal root ganglion with no inflammation. That's what it looks like on a histological slide. Here we put the inflammation. Can you see the red in the center of that DRG? That is induced inflammation. And it looks like that. Now look 21 days later. 21 days later, it's starting to look like that. That's what three adjustments a week for two weeks. And for the first time, we could show reduction of inflammation. The study showed the form of manipulation given can significantly alleviate symptoms and shorten the duration of pain and hyperalgesia caused by IVF inflammation. More data. Now, um, I gotta be careful of the time here. Um, in Australia, they got into a fight with the medical profession. It started in, in England and they spent five million dollars fighting a newspaper reporter. And there's a rule, you never want to fight anybody that buys their ink by the barrel. You're going to lose. And they killed the BCC, they wasted five million dollars. But it bled over into Australia and they started coming out saying, because we got a big presence in Australia, they came out and said that little clicker doesn't do anything and they started picking on us. So I called up the paper. I said, excuse me, we've got data. Oh, he said, I'll bet you do, send me some. So I, I sent him this rat paper. I knew what they were gonna do. And he said, well, that's nice on rats, but what about humans? Well, I knew that we just finished one on humans that Richard Roy did. And so I sent him another one, but at the bottom, because he said the, textbook, the textbooks were no good. My wife is representative of some big companies, and so she always does research, and she did research to find out that Mosby Elsevier, the big publishing house in St. Louis, owned a newspaper in Australia. It said, P.S., in case you're interested about the validity of our textbooks, they're published by your parent company. We never heard another word out of the Australian press. Data always wins. Remember that. So, these two controlled trials have wide importance to clinical research. Song just got published in the, the Journal of Clinical Investigation. We talked about that. Just to give you an idea, Here's JMPT, it affects 2% of the scientific community. That's not much. Spine is a good journal, a little over 2%. Annals of Biomechanical Engineering, now you're getting up in a really good journal, over 4%. But now look at the Journal of Clinical Investigation. It affects 12% of the academic world. That's big time. Now, BJ said, you never know how far reaching something we say may affect somebody or lives of millions tomorrow. Song from that initial little research study we did, discovered the mechanism of inflammation. Is that cool? From a chiropractic startup thing on a small business innovative research grant, he discovered the mechanism of inflammation. Now we're putting in for a $750,000 grant from NIH, because the rule in NIH is you have to publish it and show it ahead of time or they don't pay you. It's not really research, it's just confirming what they know. So, back to Baylor instrument testing. We developed a test setup that eliminates user variability, maintains compliance of biological human tissue, and directly measures the load induced into the spine. For years, our biomechanists said, fire on a steel beam because it's what? Solid. And you'll know exactly what the instruments are putting in. There's just one little problem. You're not a steel beam. You've got muscle, tissue, and so forth. So Leifner said, sorry, we have to build a new setup and it has to have the force transducers located behind the thrust. So were we right on a steel beam? Yes, except you're not a steel beam. So now we've got all new data showing how we progressed and now the information we're putting out is how does it look on a human? 
And why did we do that? Because Baylor reproduced what a human looks like on a soft spine and on a hard spine. Here's an adult. They have a different spine. Here's a baby. <laughs> Babies have different spines. Those spines are very what? Flexible. How much force do you use on a baby? Anybody know? I mean, how many are going to do pediatrics? Raise your hand. Do you know how much force to use? I do. Because a paper just got published by Angela Todd from Australia. And uh, she did her PhD. And here's what she found out. A baby up to 90 days can handle about 20 newtons of force. After 90 days, up to 50. So let's equate that to instruments. On a little baby, from zero to three months, use an activator two and turn it down to two rings, and you're fine. Once they're over three months old, you can use any instrument. You probably want to use a five because it, the baby doesn't jump. And so now we have some data to show how much force do you use on a child. Isn't that good to know? Well, let me tell you why it's good to know. A journal article came out that said activator broke a rib in a baby. And uh, when we saw that, we said, not possible, except we'll get some data together and we'll refute the Journal of Pediatrics. Well, Liebschner is a little gross, but he went over to the lab where the morgue, I'm sorry, the morgue, found some cadavers, babies, and uh, fired on the baby's ribs, not possible to break, and then he took some other engineering tests and found out how much tensile strength it took to break a rib, and we wrote a re rebuttal to the journal saying it's not possible. Long story short, they found out the child was actually abused. And somebody picked him up and hit him in a gore. That's what broke the rib. But if we hadn't written back to tell them, hey, here's what the data shows, we could have had that laying out there in the literature. Are you with me? You have to have data to protect yourselves. So how much force should we use when adjusting an infant? I just told you. You really don't know much about force until you're using an instrument because it's re reproducible. And uh, by the way, the engineers, they have no trouble with that at all. He said, why wouldn't everybody use a reproducible force? Now, here's a new word I want you to get used to using. It's called transmissibility. What it means is how much force is transmitted into the body. There's a lot of force given, but how much is transmitted? The activator produces a more transmi transmissible force than all predicate or competitive devices. How do we know? Well, because we created what's called a perfect half sine wave. In the activator 2, it was 48%. The activator 4, it was up to 74%, but with mechanical instruments, you can only adjust them so far. Then we went to the 5, because now we put a microprocessor in, and we can do anything we want to do with it. And now we're up to 94%, that's plus or minus. So we've got a perfect half sine wave. Now, in God we trust, all others bring data. <clears throat> you know who said that? Deming. And Deming was what? He was actually a production line person in building cars in Japan. But that's what he said. Let's see the data until, until you. You really got the data? Sorry, no cigar. Now, data always wins. Remember that. Um, I got a call the other day. This guy was almost crying on the phone. I said, what's wrong? He said, I just got sued. And they want my house, my firstborn, my wife, they can have her, but you know, <laughs> that's not nice. But he was shook. And I said, relax. What are they accusing you of? And then he told me, and I said, relax, we've never lost. Because we have what? We have data. And he was like taking a big sigh of relief, saying, thank God, because we did have one young lady in Texas that they took it almost to court, and by the time we got Cow Chuck and Creano and our biological and Liebschner, our, our biomechanics team, they didn't want it to go to court because they would have lost big time. And so they just decided to drop it at the end. And every time you have a drop, the attorneys look at that and they go, there's no money, let's not do that. And here's what it's all about. It's all about patience, isn't it? I mean, no matter what you do and what you say, the end result is still what's going to happen to the patient. So if my audiovisual guys will play this, please, I think you're going to see an exciting thing that happens with the patients.
I will take you back to the summer of 1995. I was 22 uh, years old at the time, uh, junior at Auburn University, majoring in molecular biology. Uh, I went on a summer missions trip. We were going whitewater rafting. I reached over, uh, grabbed a kid to keep them from falling over. I remember pulling the kid back into the boat. And I remember getting sick and losing my footing. I went overboard. Uh, I know now uh, that I actually hit my head on a rock. They worked on me in the ambulance uh, in transit for almost two hours. And when they could no longer get a heartbeat, no longer get respiration, they actually uh, called it in the ambulance, called the coroner, and said, we've got one dead on arrival. I went straight from the ambulance into the morgue. I was in the morgue for about eight hours. So they called over and they decided to do autopsy and they started the incision and I moved my hand and that's how they knew I was alive. I was in a coma for almost nine months. At times, uh, they did have signs of life and at other times they didn't. And my mom had noticed that if, if she actually brushed behind here, yeah, they all thought my mom was crazy, yeah, that, that she'd get a reaction. And she said, well, could it be that something is actually out of line? She called uh, our family chiropractor and said, yeah, is there anything that you can do? So he brought this instrument he actually used the uh, tool, the activator, and six hours later I was awake. As far as we know, uh, my atlas was badly misaligned. After about two years out from that incident, uh, they said I had recovered about 98% of what I had lost, which was absolutely everything, which hardly ever happens. I went ahead and finished my molecular biology degree at Auburn, went to chiropractic school, started in 2003. Uh, I actually did become an activator doc because uh, Dr. Kennard slipped me into the activator club and showed me, she said, you might not be so good at full spine, but she said this technique is going to be the one that you're going to be able to do with no problem. And I stood there for the first time and actually saw that instrument, saw it being used, saw the technique, and realized that that was the instrument that saved my life. I like to hit the floor. It was the first time that I actually had a name to what had saved my life. And I stood there in the second quarter and said, yes, this I'm going to be a chiropractor and this will be my technique. Hopefully, my case is teaching a lot of the activator doctors the power that they actually do have and when they see it work in such a dramatic way then they find that passion again. Activator is life, chiropractic uh, is life and uh, it is the driving life force that, that is within all of us as chiropractors. She's a life graduate. Isn't that cool? Yeah, that's a very cool story because it shows you what you're gonna do when you get out there. These are the kind of things, just a little wild, but uh, every day, and somebody asked me one day, why do you like being a doctor? I said, who wouldn't, who wouldn't like to help people? And uh, I just think it's, you know, my wife has accused me of never working a day in my life. It's because I love what I do and I, do what I love. And so I want to thank all of you for coming today and spending your time here. I hope you learned a couple of things. Thank you. Yeah.